I appreciate you joining us for another brief look into God's Word. Hope you're having a good day. Come on with us to the Gospel of Acts. We're going to be looking in Acts chapter 8 at the account of Simon the Sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, let's just get over there and let's read a little bit. In Acts chapter 8 at verse 4. And we're going to have to read a little bit just to give us a little bit of context. Acts 8 verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered, and this is after Stephen was stoned, and the persecution of the church kicked into a little higher gear, or a lot of higher gear. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there is great joy in that city. But there is a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Verse 12, But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that any one on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many of the villages of the Samaritans. A little bit lengthier reading today. Appreciate you bearing up with a word of exhortation. What points can we make about the account? Because it is an, it is an interesting account, and there's, there's n numerous points we could make. These are just a few. One of the things that this account helps us with, it helps us to see that salvation can be lost. A lot of people in the world believe that once you're saved, that you cannot lose your salvation. Well, this, this passage that we just read shows that indeed salvation can be lost. To look at what happened as all the people, as so many of the people obeyed the gospel, um, as it talks about, oh, verse 12, he preached the things, Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, both men and women were baptized. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. This is scripture testifying about Simon. He also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, and he was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. I understand he's going to have trouble here in a minute, and that's exactly the problem. He, he sins. And Peter, when he says, verse 20, Peter said to him, your money perish with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. Verse 21, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. When Peter says repent, um, or when Peter says, pardon me, your money perish with you, there in verse 20, I don't think that's Peter's way of saying that Simon was still saved. When he says, your money perish with you, was that Peter's way of saying, well, you have just lost the joy of your salvation? Because that's what actually is commonly taught in Protestant denominationalism today, that 
you don't lose your salvation. You might just lose the joy of your salvation. Frankly, I'm not even sure what that really means, but that's what is taught. I think the verse is pretty clear. Your money perish with you shows that Simon, in the state he found himself in, he had been saved, he had believed, he had been baptized, his sins had been forgiven, but now he finds himself caught up in iniquity and bitterness once again, and he was going to perish in that state. Salvation can be lost. It's not the Lord's fault. It's not the Lord's fault any more than it was the Apostles' fault in this account. It was Simon's fault because he was choosing to go back down this path, frankly. Even though his sins had been forgiven, he once again found himself bound up in iniquity. Salvation can be lost. We also learn from the account, though, how Christians in sin are saved. Yes, Simon had obeyed the gospel. He had believed. He had been baptized. As he finds himself in sin once again, let's go back and let's read the account. And what does Peter say to him? Verse 22. After verse 21, Peter says, You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. What I want you to see is in verse 22, he does not say, Therefore you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. He doesn't, he doesn't say that because Simon has already been baptized for the remission of his sins. There's only one baptism. And what this shows, all he tells him is, Repent therefore of this your wickedness. In that we see how Christians that find themselves in sin, how can we be saved? Because just because we are baptized, just because we are, have risen to walk in newness of life, does not mean that we are never going to sin again. We will, we will not because we have to, but because we choose to. Um, and it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. And I'm not saying that in any shape or form that it's the Lord's fault. I'm not saying we have to do it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it happens. What do we need to do when it happens? We need to repent. We don't need to be baptized again. If we, if, we were, if we were baptized every time we sinned, then frankly, um, our fingers were, would turn pruny from being in the water so much. And I hate, to be, I hate to make a joke out of it like that, but that's the truth of the matter. We are called to repent. We are called to simply repent. Christians who find themselves in sin. If Simon had not believed, if Simon had not been baptized, then what would Peter have told him to do? Then Peter would have said, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. He had already done that. There's only one baptism. You don't need to be baptized every time you find yourself caught in sin. Now, sometimes doesn't matter how much sin. Let me put it like that. Well, what if you find yourself caught up in some some vast sin that involves, you know, like David and Bathsheba, that involves adultery and lying and deceit and all of these different things and a child born out of wedlock, all these different things. If you find yourself caught up in all in all this big situation, well, maybe then you need to be baptized because the sin is so big. That's not what Scripture says. There's one baptism. After that, Christians who find themselves in sin, regardless of the sin, they simply need to repent and follow the Lord. Simon the sorcerer helps us understand salvation can be lost, but also, if it is lost, how is it regained? How are we saved? The passage also, and these are, these are big concepts, frankly, the passage also helps us to understand how the gifts, the spiritual gifts, the miraculous gifts, were given. Philip comes to Samaria. Philip was doing miracles, so Philip had the gifts. But yet the scripture testifies, the passage testifies, and notice what it says. Verse 18, 
when Simon saw, and this is what this is not what Simon says, this is scripture testifying that what Simon saw. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Okay? The gifts were given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Philip, although he could do the miracles, Philip, although he had the gifts, he did not have the ability to give the gifts. Only the apostles had that ability. Only the apostles. That helps us to understand how the gifts were given. That also helps us to understand how the time, the time of the miraculous gifts and the gifts of the Spirit, how it would come to a close. To look at the passage and to, to look at it and to see how things were working, there is no reason for Peter and John to be there if anybody could give the gifts. If, if anybody could give the gifts, then certainly Philip should have been able to give the gifts. He had the gifts, right? They, they intentionally, again, to look at the passage, and let me get a little higher on the screen. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem, verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so to think about it, we see that's how the gifts were given. What Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands. These things were happening. One more thing from the account. There's a lot of things we could talk about, but I think we also see how people are deceived. Because Simon the sorcerer had deceived the people for a long time. So... We, we see how people are deceived. I want you to think about how Simon, before he obeyed the gospel, think about how, how Simon did these things. He's called a sorcerer. That, that word actually has something in common with our word for pharmacy. And it looks like um, very often sorcerers back in those times would use drugs and things like that. And undoubtedly, people would see strange things. They would see strange things and they would be deceived. Right? He had deceived the people. You know, one of the one of the things that it's so hard to to get through, one of the big hurdles um, that's hard to overcome is when people when people will say something along the lines of, "Well, I saw it for myself." Well, a lot of people saw strange things with Simon the sorcerer, and they were deceived because of what they had seen for themselves. He was a trickster. That's what he was. He was a sorcerer, and he was deceiving. It says that they were deceived from the least to the greatest of them. You know, sometimes when the greatest are deceived, then the least follow suit. I think that happens, even today. When, some, when people who we admire might be mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, when they go down the wrong road, Sometimes we are deceived into thinking, well, maybe that's the path for me because if it's good enough for mom and dad, well, then it's good enough for me. We need to be very careful. It says they, they thought he was the great power of God, power of a God. Uh, I'll say this. Very often when people interject a little bit of religion into various matters, it's like it gives God's stamp of approval on it. And people, people are deceived a little bit more easily when there's an element of religion to it. You might think about that idea. Sometimes superstitions, if you interject a little bit of religion into it, people will be more superstitious. And they're, they're just being deceived. He had been doing it for a long time. You know what's said, one, well, there's a famous quote about, about lying, frankly that if you say a lie loud enough and long enough, people will start to believe it. That's probably true. That's probably true. This had been, Simon had been deceiving them for a long time. And that's another reason that people are deceived. Peter says that he was poisoned by bitterness. I think one of the things about Simon that sometimes we don't think about, he had, he, he was in a position of power 
before Philip comes along. He's in a, he was in a position of power. He obeys the gospel, but when he sees Peter and John come down and when he sees what happens through their hands, how do you think Simon felt about Peter and John? I think you can see how he felt in what Peter says, that he was poisoned by bitterness. I wonder if he was jealous of the apostles and what was happening through the apostles. You might consider that idea. Anyway, a little bit lengthier discussion today as we think about Simon the Sorcerer, but I hope it's been beneficial to you. Hope you have a good day. Hope you have a good weekend wherever you are. Appreciate you tuning in for just a little bit of our daily bread. Have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday morning, I hope.